everyone, my name is Kavita Gupta and I'm very excited to welcome you to another episode of The Impact on CNBC Africa. I'm Vince Molinari and we're broadcasting to you today from the Javits Center in New York City. What an amazing backdrop we have here today, Kavita. Very excited to call this our home studio. Absolutely. Um, today, we are talking about a company, a tech impact company, which has completely revolutionized the African health and supply chain industry. Well, who is that? <laughs> Zipline. I'm a huge, huge fan of the company. I've been following this for the last couple of years. And I'm very excited, Vince, to have the founder and CEO with us today. You know, we are so privileged to get that insight and some of the sneak preview into the factory, how things are done. And it's just amazing how far this has come in a rel relatively short period of time. Yeah, and, and when, when Kenan is walking us through the factory, the most amazing thing he talks about is him being a young entrepreneur back in Tanzania and literally building small drones. And from there to the government of Rwanda, really trusting them and their healthcare system. Well, it's absolutely inspirational when you think about that journey, right? From a, a young mind that had the courageous vulnerability to dream and dare and come up with something and just see the profound impact that he's actually having on the healthcare of people that you can quantify. 15,000 people's lives saved in one year just because you can actually provide uh, supply, medical supplies and especially blood stems, blood cells, on like within 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Like that's the sort of impact we never imagined gonna come from the air. <laughs> and, and I think even more so perhaps, we can't even imagine what's next and where this can go and the difference that it can make. Yeah, from Rwanda to Ghana and I am pretty, I, I have a huge faith in this company, Zipline. It's gonna take over the world and save millions and billions of life. Amen to that. Looking forward to the show. I'm very excited today to have Keller on our show. Keller is the CEO and co-founder of Zipline, an American medical product delivery company that designs, builds, and operates. The company operates distribution centers in Rwanda and Ghana. Before Zipline, he was also the CEO and co-founder of Promotive, a former company established in 2011 that made inexpensive small robots that use mobile phones as their computing system, machine vision system, and wireless communication system. And I should say one of the very few people who gave two TED Talks, one for each company. Keller, welcome to The Impact. Thank you so much for taking time out. How are you doing? Thanks, Kavita. I'm great. Thank you for having us. Um, Keller, I actually have been at the TED when you gave your second TED, uh, second TED speech. I'm a robotics entrepreneur who spent a lot of time here in Africa. And in 2014, we created Zipline. Basically, literally start from, where is this love for drones coming? Because it looks like that's been your whole life. I think that, uh, you know, we always talk about loving the problem, not loving the solution. And I, I think... It was, our backgrounds were in robotics and automation um, when we were starting to build Zipline in 2013. But what we really fell in love with was the idea of a logistic system that would so serve all humans equally. Because the reality is that logistics, you know, especially healthcare logistics, really only does a good job of serving the golden billion people on the planet well today. And a lot of people don't have access to basic medical products they need to be healthy or survive. Um, and so, we, we just felt like technology had gotten to a point where it's actually possible to build new kinds of logistics systems or transform logistics systems um, in, a, in a way that everybody can depend on them with their lives, not just you know, the, the golden few. And so that was the problem that we fell in love with. Everything that we do, all of the you know, vehicles you can see behind me and everything that we do from an autonomy perspective is designed to, um, is really designed to accomplish that, that or, or address that challenge. Zipline has been going through a huge boost, uh, like during the whole COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration approved Zipline for the delivery of medical supplies and personal protective equipments to hospitals in North Carolina. Uh, tell us more about this. How did that come about? When the pandemic, you know, we had already been working closely with the FAA over the last three years. They had seen these kinds of systems getting to national scale. I mean, Zipline today serves 2,500 hospitals and health facilities across Rwanda and Ghana. So it's now achieved full national scale, delivering 160 different medical products in a way that 25 million people can depend on with their lives and the lives of their kids. So the U.S. doesn't want to fall 
behind in a fundamental area of technology. So the FAA had already been working to figure out how to adjust regulation and kind of catch up in the US. Uh, but the pandemic really presented a clear opportunity to immediately have the benefit of this technology to help healthcare systems respond. So we had already partnered with Navant Healthcare in North Carolina. They, they're a large hospital system in the Charlotte area. Um, and the FAA luckily was you know, sort of sprung into action and got us emergency exemptions so that we could begin doing the, the first uh, beyond visual line of sight deliveries um, in, um, well, really in, in US history, delivering a whole bunch of COVID-19 related products so that Navant could respond to the pandemic and sort of show how you can use this technology um, to be um, to be a faster, more agile health system. Oh. Uh, but in this case, US is actually following uh, based on what you have already achieved outside the country, especially in Africa. Yeah, I think that's a really important distinction. I mean, I, we always, I think a lot of people have a sense that this kind of technology, all advanced technology is going to start in some of the richest or largest co countries in the world and then trickle its way out. And actually the exact opposite is happening. You know, we see countries, developing countries that are more innovative, a little bit more risk tolerant, investing in infrastructure and healthcare, actually showing the entire rest of the world how you can use this technology to save lives. Very fascinating. I think the first time when I felt like this was in 2007 and 8 when the fintech revolution started with M-Pesas leading the way, even till today, how peer-to-peer -peer payment systems should happen in the developed country. Um, going back to Zipline, um, I would love to go back. So you started the company at that point of time, back in 2013, drones, people were, people have started talking about it, but it was not a real, real reality. And especially in the healthcare space, there was a conversation about maybe delivery packages. How did you envision it? And what has been one of the most tough season while, till you reach here? You know, I think that um, getting started, it, it relied on, you know, a little bit of skill and a little bit of luck. Um, the, I, I think that one of the, some of the biggest reasons that Zipline was able to survive those first few years were that we, we were a small team, we were naive, we didn't really know uh, what we were doing when we got started. You know, this is like a little scary to say, but, you know, we had worked, we, we, I had talked with the Minister of Health of Rwanda. I remember this conversation where I was sort of saying, hey, we'll do everything. You know, we, we want to deliver to every medical facility and every hospital and all different medical products, which by the way, is what we do now. But at the time, you know, she was wise enough to say, tell her, shut up, just do blood. The blood would be enough. And as she was explaining it to me, she was explaining that, um, that they were 50% of transfusion, they were, the transfusions they were delivering were going toward moms with postpartum hemorrhaging. 30% were going toward kids. Uh, and it's a it's really challenging from a logistics perspective because you have packed red blood cells, plasma, platelets, and cryoprecipitates. And each of those components has different storage requirements, different shelf lives. Platelets only last six days, for example, and have to be constantly agitated. And then it's also typed. So you have A, B, and A, B, and O, uh, and negative and positive rhesus factor of, of each. It's a really, really hard logistics problem. And as a result, a lot of blood in every single healthcare system on earth gets thrown out and access is also a challenge. A lot of times people don't have access to a transfusion when they need it. So, uh, you know, it was actually, I think one of the biggest parts of our success was just us listening closely to a customer and an expert and a minister of health who had been living with these problems for decades and was able to guide our hands in terms of understanding, hey, you know, if instant delivery were possible, how could this save lives and what would be the right focused way of showing that you can get started? Um, so. I don't know if I did a good job of answering your question, but like th those were the core things that kind of like influenced us both, you know, launching in Rwanda first and then enabling us to succeed when in reality, you know, we, we weren't experts, but our customer was an expert and we were agile and humble enough to figure out how to, how to address the problem that she was focusing on. And we didn't even necessarily get it right on the first try. I mean, we actually, you know, it took us several months of just serving one hospital before we could expand beyond that because we had a lot to learn terms of getting the iron, the, the kinks ironed out of the system um, in those early days. But I think the process starts a little early. How did you end up in Rwanda? Was there a previous experience that you felt like this is the right place to start? Um, just real, I mean, really, you know, we had a sense that probably a 
you know, a, a smaller country would be able to move faster. That was like the main intuition that we had. So, you know, even as mainly U.S. at the time, you know, mainly U.S. company today, we're half African and a half U.S. But we had a sense that the U.S. was going to move too slow. So we already knew we wanted to go find a small country that was investing heavily in healthcare technology and infrastructure. Uh, and so, you know, I, I was actually at that time spending a lot of time in Tanzania and happened to be fortuitously, we, we happened to be fortuitously introduced to the president in Rwanda and sort of quickly just realized that, you know, he and the minister of health were going to be amazing champions. They wanted to do this. They were looking for an area where Rwanda could lead the world. Um, and yeah, that partnership has really blossomed. I mean, today Rwanda has, you know, the most advanced autonomous delivery system on earth. And many other countries, I mean, Ghana has already followed in Rwanda's footsteps. And now, for example, the U.S. is sending you know, folks from the FAA to Rwanda to understand how they've built this technology and made it work. This is so amazing. The tides are already reversed. <laughs> Very exciting. And, and you're right. I think um, uh, all my years, six years, which I've spent in that region, I've realized that uh, they say um, necessity is the mother of all invention. And that also creates a space to have the best products, the best experiments out, which can change the world. Looks like this is one of those spaces. Um, Keller, it's a very infrastructure operation heavy company. This is one thing to go to Rwanda and create a drone and then start, you know, working it out and making it better. But to actually also come back to the VCs and having that faith and create those that investment. How was that experience? It was very difficult. I mean, when we when we started doing this, you know, everybody thought it was really stupid. Uh, nobody thought that building an autonomous system for healthcare and, you know, to deliver medical products um, in Rwanda or Ghana was going to work. And we spoke to a lot of experts in global public health who told us that we were wasting our time, that there was no chance. It wasn't a real problem. Technology was never going to work. We were never going to get regulatory approval. No one would ever pay for it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, luckily, we didn't, you know, we, we largely didn't listen. We were listening to customers and the true experts, who, you know, in our opinions, were the actual doctors and nurses and ministers of health um, who had been living those problems every single day. I, so, yeah, I, I think you know, that was, um, that was a big kind of turning point when we were, when we were starting to focus on those customer needs, when we were able to sign those first customer contracts and very few investors wanted to fund the company at that time. Uh, but there were just enough I think who saw that, hey, you know, maybe this paradigm shift is happening. And I think now it's really proven true. If you look at, there's so many autonomy companies that have raised billions or tens of billions of dollars, but have not yet been able to launch into the real world uh, because of regulatory hurdles. And I think you know, more and more, it's gonna become clear that taking those kinds of autonomous technology and applying them to the absolute most important problems that humanity faces and working with governments that are maybe a little bit smaller so that they can make decisions faster. I think that at the end of the day, that wound up being the right strategy. Uh, and so we were able to raise just enough money for the company to survive those first couple of years. And then as we were to start to experience, as we started to experience success in the field, we were actually able to just start giving video tours of, you know, planes flying and products being loaded into planes and delivering to hospitals at national scale. Fundraising got a lot easier. So you know, generally Zipline has to be able to combine customer contracts plus you know, venture capital funding along with uh, partnerships and global public health to fund this kind of infrastructure at national scale um, and get it to the point where it can save save lives and where people can depend on it. As I say, persistent belief and a little bit of luck. <laughs> um, yep, totally. You touched base upon regulations and regulatory bodies. I, I would love to know, even while everyone around the world is understanding drones in one or the other way going to be part within health space, within delivery, within something else, military, land mining, land titling. Um, 
there's a lot of use case. Um, as you guys are expanding, and I want to come to India after this question, but um, what are the places you are finding that the governments are being super supportive and want to explore it with you and where you still feel a world is a little shut down? I think that, honestly, probably when we were getting started in 2014, 2015, when we were, and, and we launched in Rwanda in 2016, I mean, at that time, there were very few countries in the world who would have bet on a team that looked like us. I mean, we were just, you know, 15 people, a little bit clueless, no track record of success. I think at that time, it took a very special kind of country and a special kind of leader to take a bet on a startup like that to work on a national healthcare system. Uh, but today I would say, especially with the pandemic, we've seen that dramatically shift. And at this point, not only are people now able to see the data that is coming out of healthcare systems that Zipline serves, seeing the way that they're able to save large amounts of money by centralizing inventory and throwing out less medicine that expires while dramatically increasing access for the most vulnerable people in those countries you know, if, if Rwanda has become one of the first countries in the world to, to achieve 15 to 30 minute delivery of almost any medical product to almost any person in the country. And you know, the Minister of Health has been saying for a long time, like, if we can do it, any country can do it. It's just a matter of will. And I think that the pandemic is just accelerating that trend. I think healthcare systems now across the world are saying, hey, we thought we had 10 years to sort of transform ourselves and digitize ourselves. Now we're realizing we have one year. So you see telepresence skyrocketing. It's all, every single healthcare system is trying to figure out how does it extend the reach of the hospital closer to where people live, either to a primary care facility or directly into the home. Um, and Zipline has a big role to play in that. Um, and so, yeah, today I, I would be probably be hard pressed to find a country that isn't planning to invest in this area. Um, and so it's totally shifted. Whereas, you know, four years ago, it was like, what, you know, what's, what's a country that would want to do this today? It's, I think it would be hard to find a country that doesn't want to. You must be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so that, tell me more about India because that's your new country where you are expanding, you have a team on the ground. What's happening in India for you? Yeah, and by the way, I, I apologize. It might be a little loud here. You know, I am in a, in a like operational factory. So I apologize for any, any noise behind us. No, we do want to talk about the beautiful drones behind you after that. Cool. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, when it comes to India, so we have been working closely with um, Maharashtra State. Um, they're, you know, we work closely with the Minister of Health there, um, as well as the, the uh, government to find ways of taking the system that you already see operating now in uh, Rwanda, Ghana, and now the United States and making it available in India. Obviously, India is a really big, complicated country. Um, and it, it politically complicated, but uh, I think what is super clear is the need and the impact that equitable access to healthcare could have, especially for the hundreds of millions of people who live in rural areas and who are, you know, who really struggle to get access through either primary care facilities or hospitals today. Um, blood logistics, for example, is a major challenge that significantly contributes to maternal health. Uh, problems in India and, and, and something that this kind of technology could have a huge impact on. So, um, you know, we are, um, the, the pandemic has, has been a little bit of a delay, but we're, we're very passionate about India and Zipline has a whole India team that's focused just on working with states who are wanting to adopt this kind of technology to transform their healthcare systems. Um, and does Zipline continue to do just the healthcare space or do you think there's going to be shift to other areas too? People often ask us, I mean, once the technology is built, you know, use cases come out of the woodworks. There's so many different uh, parties and businesses and even you know, branches of government that can use this kind of logistics to solve a lot of different problems. The reality today is that healthcare is complicated enough. I mean, healthcare logistics is a massive market. There's a lot to it. Um, you know, today in some countries where we serve, we're serving almost every hospital and primary care facility in the country. But the next big milestone for us is, you know, a lot of these hospital systems now want to be able to deliver directly to patients' homes. Um, they want to be able to use home healthcare nurses who might travel to a home, see what a patient needs, press a button on a phone. And you know, there's a question, can that product be teleported to that home healthcare nurse in just a couple minutes? And so 
suffice it to say, we really have our hands full focusing on healthcare. And we also think there's a moral imperative to get that right first. And so we, we plan to be, you know, the company is going to be growing really, really rapidly for the next five years. And we don't plan to substantially invest outside of healthcare during that time. Are there any particular countries which are on your horizon for expansion over the next two to five years? Well, if you were following our Twitter account, I think that uh, the government of Nigeria last week announced, uh, well, the, the governor of Kaduna State in Nigeria announced that they have just signed a new partnership with Zipline um, to build three new distribution centers and serve something like, I think, six million people in the state. They'll be able to cover the entire state as well as, as, well as parts of surrounding states. Um, and so we're really excited to be launching in Nigeria, obviously the largest economy in Africa, one of the most diverse and you know, vibrant countries on earth. Uh, and it's exciting to see them kind of following in the footsteps of, of Rwanda and Ghana. And I think it's becoming pretty clear that this is not a one-off thing, this is a movement. And uh, I think the fact that the countries themselves are leading their own transformations rather than lying, relying, overly relying on global public health institutions is a pretty big paradigm shift and, and very inspiring. Yeah, and it is a very, very impactful business. I mean, I have seen one of the deliveries of Zipline for the blood cells by myself, and it is going to the regions right outside the city, to the rural areas. It's, it's very, very impactful. Do you get to really feel it, enjoy, and feel the impact personally as a founder of everything? You know, I, I mean, <laughs> the experience of trying to do something for the first time in the world, and especially something in a highly regulated intersection of, of or the intersection of two highly regulated industries like aerospace and healthcare, it's definitely stressful and it's hard. And um, I think the team, you know, I and the rest of the team have, have gone through, I mean, we'll do whatever it takes in order to make sure that we can, um, that patients can rely on us. And especially over the last year with COVID, we've seen teams, you know, our, our operations teams at all of our different global distribution centers, um, whereas a lot of people are quarantining, like a lot of those teams have continue to come into work every day and risk their own health in order to secure the health of those who depend on us. And so I would say the overwhelming emotion I feel is pride. Um, I think that there are a lot of doctors and nurses and health systems across the world that are you know, pulling all-nighters and doing whatever it takes to, to get the world through this pandemic. And if we can be a small part in empowering them and making sure they have what they need, then we're, we're really proud. Keller, this story is so amazing, so inspiring and so powerful. Um, let's just take a tour of your factory. Yeah, this is where we are manufacturing all of the aircraft that are basically getting shipped out to distribution centers in Africa or uh, distribution centers in the U.S. So this is where we're doing final pre-flight check uh, of all the aircraft. Which is actually going to go out. Can we go closer to it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is the fuselage. You can see this is plane number 922. Oh. Uh, and so you can see the flight computer here, as well as the um, kind of the skeleton of the aircraft, which is made of um, carbon um, carbon fiber. I think you and Zipline and everybody working with Zipline, at Zipline, are already a big part of it. Um, thank you so much, Keller, for taking time out. I know you're very busy. I can see the factory right behind you building new uh, drones ready to be delivered and shipped out. And I am really looking forward to have Zipline every part of the world, wherever we travel down to and we see one of the Zipline, we would know the story behind it. Thank you so much, Keller, for joining us today. It was a big honor. Thank you. Vince, what a powerful story. And how amazing to see things in action, the assembly, the testing of the drones. What, what a wonderful sneak preview that we had. I wanted to be there. I wanted to touch it and like also block it and feel like I can make drones, by the way. <laughs> well, maybe next we're going to do that with some virtual reality. Yeah, I, I think we need to call up Keller and like just go there. Um, so what, what was your biggest takeaway? Look, I, I think it's the impact that this could have and how next going to India, right? And what that means as this is so scalable. Vince, but this just reminds me of the days of M-Pesa. They started in Africa, they got all this recognition in Africa, then they went to US to get the contract with USPS during the COVID time. They are already figuring out in India. I feel like every revolutionary impact tech in this world is now going to come from countries like India, continent like Africa, and then hit US. 
Well, I think we're seeing a little bit of a paradigm shift when we begin to embrace all of the skills, talents, resources that these countries have and bringing forward that brain trust to create and solve for endemic problems of those countries and continents and we're reverse engineering back to established markets. Absolutely. I love this trend and I want this to flourish. So that's all from my side today. Well, can't wait to have some more in the next episode. Thank you so much for joining us. Looking forward to seeing you guys next time.